welcome. And uh, I want to first say that this book, um, I've been reading it over the past couple of uh, past couple of weeks. And I have to say, and I was saying this to Rukmini earlier, that this, to, to my mind, is one of the most important books to have uh, been published in India in, in the last few years. Um, I was struck, of course, obviously, by all the data that uh, um, Rukmini has gathered uh, and uh, the perspective that she has given all this data. But more than that, I think this book tells you this remarkable story about India, about how it's developing, where it's headed. And that is where it's, it's, its true strength lies. Uh, so we'll begin uh, immediately, uh, Rukmini, with uh, a question that I have from the audience, uh, to the audience. How many of you here, uh, and be frank, regard yourselves as middle class? Just put up your hands, just a quick show of hands. Okay, um, I'm uh, glad to see there were a lot of hands that were down. Um, so now, the data, and this is this is the data that was uh, uh, at, the, at the core of a recent controversy as well. The data that Rukmini has used in this book show that in, that average Indian spends two thousand five hundred rupees a month. If you spend more than eight thousand five hundred rupees, you're in the top five percent. Uh, and these are pre-pandemic data. So, uh, Rukmini, let's begin with that question: Are we, uh, as a country, are we actually this poor? Are these data uh, inaccurate? And why, and, and why has the project of uh, poverty estimation taken a backseat since uh, 2014? Thank you, Samar, and thank you for those kind words in the beginning as well. Um, I think this is one of those statistics that, um, that always, um, you know, provokes, oh, sorry, that always um, gets a response from people because we all like to believe that we are, in fact, middle class. Uh, when we're not, we're not just in the top 5% of the country, we're probably here in the top 0.01% of the country. This is a deeply unequal country with the top 0.01% having a disproportionate influence on every sphere, including writing books in English. Um, so is the data accurate? Yes and no. It is, um, it is a fact that, um, uh, you know, one of the things is that we in, in India, we use spending as a proxy for income, and that's not necessarily the same thing. So yes, that is one sort of established criticism of the right against the, uh, you know, project of um, estimation of um, class in India. Um, so, um, you know, the, but let me say this, that, um, the truth is unlikely to be very far from this because when we have other um, estimates of income from other surveys, they also show pretty similar figures. What we're probably doing the, the worst job of counting is the incomes and the spending of the very rich because that's um, likely what the NSSO does the worst job of capturing. So the right, the economic right does have some um, you know, th there is some justification to their complaints about uh, the NSSO, India's official statistical system, and how good it is at capturing uh, consumption. But I would argue that the picture that it that it's likely to paint if if this gets better is one of a more unequal country than the one that we know of as yet. And um, you know, just to take this out of the realm of just numbers into uh, the political is issues that numbers find themselves in right now is that. One of the things that's happening in the last couple of years is a severe discrediting of the NSSO. And this sort of consumption data is one of the axes on which, uh, which is, you know, one of the sticks that are used to beat the NSSO, that there's no way this country could be so poor, we're all middle class, there's no way that spending this much puts us in the top 5% of the country. And while it's, it is likely that the NSSO gets some of its estimations wrong, I think it's very important to focus very specifically and you know in a laser ma sharp manner on what it is that it gets wrong because the sort of atmosphere of blanket hand waving at the data allows for neglect um, a bit of sneering mocking derision of indian statistics to the point that for the first time in indian history we uh, had a consumption expenditure survey put out by the government in 2017-18 which they never released we know it's ready we know what the findings are, I have them. It was leaked by the business standard reporter, Somesh Jha. Uh, the government disagreed with them because it you know, painted a historically low picture of um, consumption in, uh, increases in income consumption. And the government said that we're not gonna put it out 
um, instead of saying, let's put it out and criticize it as has happened in the past. And I feel quite, um, you know, I think every generation has a couple of moments where they feel, how did we let this happen on our watch? And in my own nerdy way, I feel this about in the history of Indian statistics, how did we let this happen on our watch? How have we allowed for the first time in Indian history for a consumption expenditure survey to just not be released on our watch? It's, it's a huge feeling of all pillars of democracy that, that we let this happen just two years ago. Sorry, that's a very long-winded answer. So I, uh, I want to talk to you about my personal favorite bits in this uh, book, which is uh, what Indians eat. Now, Indians, you you know, uh, India is clearly, you know, more, more non-vegetarian than vegetarian. They confess to being more vegetarian than non-vegetarian. And meat eating has been growing and vegetarianism, um, vegetarian states appear to support the BJP more than those that are uh, meat eating. Now, how much of this is, is, uh, is correct? And what are the nuances here? Because there are obviously lots of nuances here. Uh, and we are, of course, in Karnataka, where the whole... Uh, uh, egg for lunch issue has now become a political hot button uh, issue. So, you know, I'd like both of you to weigh in on this uh, on this whole thing. Uh, one, you know, so, so if you could provide the uh, the political um, uh, context to this whole question of eggs in meals in in Karnataka, and then if you could uh, provide us with the larger context, uh, which we were discussing earlier as well, uh, as to uh, what people eat and how those are related to the political choices that states make. Uh, so about the food chapter, I mean, one of the things that comes through very clearly over there is that the average Malayali eats the best in the country, right? <laughs> so they're having more fruits, more meat, more vegetables, more nuts. And the opposite is the case with large parts of Karnataka, particularly these seven districts where the controversy is, uh, you know, uh, really blazing. Uh, other districts which also happen to be the with, with the worst indices. And... Uh, you know, if you look at it as a sociologist, you can't see, you, got, you don't have to look far to see why, what the reason behind it could be. The fact that it's a re, re, region which is also steeped in religious uh, fundamentalism. There's a certain amount of influence that these seers wield over there, which can make the government bend. So that's, I mean, the political context is pretty obvious. I mean, we live in the times of Hindutva. Okay. And that, in fact, okay, if you'll allow me to also bring that aspect in, you know, so um, every now and then we like to believe that it is not Hindutva that brought this party to power, that development is one of the things that people voted on, uh, you know, a, a certain, uh, you know, we love to talk about anti-incumbency and all those things. Uh, while we're talking about eggs and about food, uh, if you can also touch about the attitudes of young people, educated people, vis-a-vis -vis things such as non-vegetarian food, um, beef, um, temple, uh, all of those things. So the, how the numbers play out, and that's for me the scariest part, which uh, is literally, I mean, you know, we all know this to be true, true anecdotally, but the numbers she's put together are quite amazing. So if you can rattle some of those off, you know, because in the long run, it seems you're all dead, you know. So yeah, if you can please talk about that also, yeah. So uh, yes, I mean, on, on meat eating, um, uh, the fundamental facts are that we are a uh, overwhelmingly uh, meat eating country. Um, there are some parts of the country that are almost uniformly meat eating. Um, vegetarianism is more common among uh, upper caste uh, and among religious community, religious minority communities like uh, Jains. So this is the broad sort of spectrum. And, you know, I, I think it's um, beyond argument that uh, the poorest children of the country who, uh, you know, neatly intersect with those belonging to um, um, uh, religious minorities, including Muslims, as well as uh, those belonging to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes are the ones who are more likely to be meat eating uh, in their homes anyway, and the ones who, uh, you know, deserve the best nutrition, that, that, that should be our fundamental uh, if that's what we're trying to do here, they deserve the best nutrition and at least a choice of it. But I, I just have, you know, one sort of digression on this um, consensus on eggs, which is uh, one thing that bothers me, I think less so in Karnataka, but more so in some of the north central states is that um, I feel that eggs has become sort of uh, central to the point of almost 
uh, taking over the conversation around food and around uh, the nutrition of children in the country. And, uh, you know, kids who want it should get access to uh, the most nutritious and the food they want. But I do think we need to be cognizant of the fact that meat, uh, you know, food choices vary significantly between states. And uh, the majority of mothers um, in states like Madhya Pradesh or Rajasthan are vegetarians who don't eat eggs at home, the majority of these families. So there is an argument to be made that if you're giving it as an option in schools, then it's an option for any of the kids who come there. But it bothers me that sometimes that, you know, this has become a bit of a single point focus of the left without an adequate acknowledgement that some of the states that you're talking about are not primarily egg eating states. So maybe it doesn't need to be like the single stick with which you keep banging on in those states in particular. That's that's a thought over there. And actually just to add to that, in the so, so many of those numbers also show up that the BJP has taken the shape of India and not the other way around. You I know, absolutely so. agree. I absolutely agree. So one of the maps that, you know, comes up often on social media is the sort of intersection between BJP rule states and uh, states that don't offer eggs in school. The implication being that after the BJP has come, they've stopped offering eggs in school. I would say that what it's more likely to show is a correlation between states in which more people are vegetarian and states that are more likely to vote for the BJP. It's sort of, you know, it's not the tail that's wagging the dog in this case. Um, and to talk more broadly about um, beliefs, especially when uh, talking about younger people. Yes, I, I feel like, um, you know, one of the, along with the, with the comforting blanket that we are all middle class, another of the sort of uh, comforting thoughts we need to, we like to wrap around ourselves let's say liberals like to wrap around ourselves, is that um, at our core, we are a you know, tolerant, belonging, secular country, and that there's a fringe that has these beliefs. And I just, having looked at uh, data on thoughts and beliefs, I just consistently don't see any uh, reason to feel this way at all. Um, Indians consistently show lower regard for civil rights than most other countries, including Pakistan, a strong sort of thread of uh, preference for authoritarianism runs through lack of respect for the civil rights of the other, including what they eat, who they pray to, um, their right to speak, their right to watch movies. It runs through the country. It runs deeply through young people. You're the happiest with our democracy. I would not be surprised from that. Yeah, they think that uh, government works well, but uh, would like all of these restrictions. And um, there has been a sort of assumption that with rising incomes, education, urbanization, there'll be a, you know, a secular drift towards uh, more liberal values. And uh, we see, you know, it, it's abundantly clear that that's not happening. There is no reason we should be assuming that should happen. And uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that not just to know what the, what the country at large thinks, but also because we cannot abandon, if we believe that there is a project towards making people more tolerant and liberal, and let's say we broadly agree on that. Um, I cannot, I don't think this can be thrown at the door of politics alone, because if, if we are seeing this across the board, that younger people, young people, the majority of young people in this country don't believe anyone should have an intercaste marriage, let alone whether they are having intercaste marriages or not. anyone. 85 years after Ambedkar said that intercaste marriage is the only solvent for caste, the majority of young people in this country believe no one should have, it should be outlawed, no one should have an intercaste marriage. This is not a failure of politics alone. It's, it's a failure of everything, you know, to be at this stage. So that, I think it's important to acknowledge these this sort of centrality of all of this so that we don't, uh, you know, we don't make this a problem of politics alone. Just, just a quick point to add over the way you talk about intercaste marriages, right? So can we connect that back to your opening chapter, which I loved a lot, which was about crime, the NCRB statistics and rape and how, uh, so as a reporter, you know, I, I really um, uh, love the fact that when the rape uh, uh, discussion was making headlines and everyone's talking about how much rape there is in India and all that. You actually went into 600 cases uh, in Delhi and about a couple of hundred in Mumbai, case by case. And what you found is fantastic. So if you can connect it back to even this intercaste. Yeah. Also, if I may just add, you speak specifically of the fact that uh, uh, crime is reported and counted. It's just not, uh, we're not the ones that are uh, that, that are the ones reported. Yes, yeah, so I think I went into this expecting to see 
um, the thwarting of the sexual agency of young women. That is what I was expecting to see. I didn't expect to see um, what the, the point that you point out, which is the sort of weaponization of parental disapproval of intercaste and inter-religious marriages. And not only did the data show me that, it also pointed me in a direction that makes me worry about the current moment where, you know, there, there's never been anything more dangerous and more brave right than the is right now than to fall in love with someone who's not of the same religion or caste than you. There is, I can't think of anything braver that anyone in this country is doing. So yes, what drove me to it was that in 2012, when the conversation around um, uh, sexual violence began and it was important and necessary overdue had to happen. Um, I was very bothered by the way news reporting was focused. My focus was on, uh, was going. My focus was on news reporting that I felt was being so um, uh, loyal to the FIR that it was creating a distorted picture on the basis of which uh, women and families were forming their own uh, uh, sense of safety. I was feeling, I lived in Delhi at the time, I was scared to, you know, go out, I didn't know what was happening, I was reading all of these news stories, and, and again, let me reiterate that none of this diminishes the problem of sexual violence and routine ha harassment that, you know, is endemic in the country, but I don't, uh, but the way news was reporting sexual assault in particular is not the way which was, that it was happening. Anyone who spent any time in a police station, and, you know, all the journalists here, as young reporters have spent inordinate amounts of times in the police station almost sort of waiting for a crime to happen because that makes your story for the next day as you do as a young journalist you've seen the way police stations work and what goes into an FIR and when you realize that that is being used as shorthand for crime safety um, uh, capacity or incapacity of governments it it becomes it's terrifying so because I wasn't satisfied with police statistics alone I ended up reading court cases and that too is not a full picture and by no means is this you know scientific certainty but it took me sort of a little further than what the FIR alone would show and one of the things it did show was that 40 percent of the cases involving IP3C 376 which is sexual assault uh, 40 percent of the cases fully tried in one calendar year were actually to do with uh, parental criminalization of consenting young couples and as I you know the point I do want to make is that which isn't to sort of throw this in the bin of false cases and, you know, uh, uh, you know, poor men being, uh, I mean, there's a crime going on against women as well. These women were being thrown in shelter homes. Violence was being inflicted on them by their families. Some of them were pregnant and were being put in shelter homes because their families did not want them to, you know, go back and uh, meet the. And all of this, I just want to end by saying, all of this is about to get a lot worse. The way we are behaving about interreligious marriage in this country, we are about to make all of this a lot worse. No, just I was just trying to add to the the point that if the actual violence happens at home to prevent these marriages, these alliances, uh, to keep the endogamous structure. So yeah, and also that uh, your statistics show that a woman is more unsafe in her neighborhood in her home than she is out on the street. You know, so yeah. And also, you know, when we talk about uh, the stigma around uh, filing cases of sexual assault, which is uh, you know, absolutely true and definitely exists. And the police have a long way to go. The judiciary has a long way to go. One of the things the numbers ended up showing me was that the stigma of having a daughter who's married out of the religion or caste can even be greater than the stigma of being associated as a family with a sexual assault case. So I don't think we should, you know, have any great certainty about where values in this country lie. Yeah, you also mentioned the fact that uh, most sexual assaults happen within marriage. Yeah. Uh, and obviously the fact in India, uh, marital rape is, is not a crime is, is, a, is, a, is a factor there. So I, I'd like to refer you back again to Karnataka and your findings on uh, some, some very interesting findings on cross-cultural uh, beliefs. Um, so we have had a surge of attacks on, uh, you know, Christian prayer, prayer halls. And the interesting thing as uh, um, as my colleague Mohitra, who was in this audience, pointed out to me, is that most of these are Protestant gatherings where the congregants may not actually have converted. So, in the sense that they are all uh, would be recorded officially as being um, uh, as Hindu, not Christian, exactly. How do we assess cross cultural beliefs? You say, for instance, you know that 17% of Hindus say that they have celebrated Christmas. An even larger percent of Muslims, as I recall, uh, have celebrated Diwali. Um, and the interesting thing I found was that 8% of Muslims have prayed at a temple and 6% of, of, of Hindus uh, at a mosque. Can you give us such, some insights into uh, all these data that you've gathered? 
Sure. Um, there's sort of two ways that I feel about this. One is that, yes, I think, you know, we need a greater acknowledgement of uh, hybrid cultural practices in the country with religious culture, cultural practices. And, you know, one of the things that binds people across uh, uh, religions is belief in God men, for example, you know, the, this belief in God men is enormous across the country and across religious groups as well. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to read out one story of uh, a person I spoke to about, you know, whose hybrid practices sort of embody all that, all of the data that you just um, talked about. Dee Suguna is a school teacher in Madurai, Sorry, Tamil Nadu. I was just going to read that out as a problem. I beat you to it. <laughs> go ahead, go right ahead. Her daily go-to God is Pillayar, known as Ganesha Ganpati in other parts of the country whose statue she prays before every morning in a small cubby in her kitchen. At times of great stress, the one she thinks of is Shirdi Sai Baba. Her 2005 trip with her school teacher friends to visit the temple was one of the highlights of her life. Her husband's family believes in a god man based in Rameshwaram, who they must visit once a year. Her daughter Vani follows all of her mother's practices, but in her heart, she says, is Jesus. Suguna is not unhappy. Vani's wedding will be in a temple. I know she asked for Jesus' blessings for her college exams. I don't mind as long as someone makes her pass. <laughs> yeah. okay. I was struck by that as well. Okay, if you're going to do excerpts, I mean, there's one part uh, where you talk about uh, intercaste and religious marriages, and this one uh, guy says, Madam, it is not, yeah, that part. Please. Yeah, I'm actually very struck by how much Nitin's story has uh, resonated with people. Um, it's a young man named Nitin Kamade from Maharashtra, from Satara, who I spoke to. And I think uh, one of the reasons the story has stuck with people, first of all, it is my firm belief that there's nothing in the world young people like to talk about more than being in love. If you get into a taxi and, you know, you just have two minutes of conversation they want to tell you about their love stories it's great you, all over the country you hear it and once they hear i have had a love marriage then it's you know open season they want to yeah they want to hear all about it so you know nitin uh, was is in a relationship with a girl from another caste and he was uh, worried about all of these things that he had hidden from his family and he didn't know what he was going to do about it but um the end of the story is something that's, I think, struck stuck with people. And it stuck with me too, in a way, because it makes me question certainties of data. And, you know, all through the chapter, I talk about how small the share of people in intercaste and interreligious marriages is. And then I took this data back to Nitin and I asked him if this made him feel lonely, like an outsider. I talked to Nitin about what the data showed and asked him if this made him feel like an exception. He told me I was wrong, but not because he didn't believe the data or because he thought it was fake, which is other people immediately assume things are fake. That's data about marriage, madam, he said, not about love. I think if your data asked people if they have ever fallen in love with someone from another caste or religion, many will say yes. I see that all around me among my friends. But when it comes to getting married, most of us are not yet ready to leave our families. That's why your data looks like that. So when you talk about what the data can and cannot tell us, maybe this is one of the things that the data can't tell us. All the sort of, you know, uh, brave battles that people in love are fighting, which which may not end up going very well. I think this is one of the power. The, the, the power of the book is also because there's a lot of storytelling uh, that uh, really lightens it up. And uh, these two sections that she read out, I had marked for reading as well. So <laughs> <laughs> there are some truly remarkable stories. I, I encourage you to read them. If we may now move a bit on to, um, uh, uh, you know, politics, uh, electoral uh, issues, etc. The one thing that struck me was that many of us, you know, tend to uh, abhor or criticize uh, the personal messaging that's used by a lot of politicians, especially the Prime Minister, uh, Yogi Adityanath, Arvind Kejriwal. All the messaging has really become very uh, personal. But you clearly indicate that there appears to be a backstory here, that it's not simply because of megalomania or megalomania alone. So what is the backstory? Uh, sorry, someone could you say what exactly? Yeah, you, you've, you've said that, you know, the, the person that is the personal messaging that they do is because voters tend uh, not to vote for things like development. And there is very much more to it than that. Right. And I think that you've, you've elaborated on that uh, very uh, right. interestingly. So because, um, you know, when I worked in newsrooms, the uh, and we were talking about this just earlier, but when I worked in newsrooms, the vast majority of my job ended up being 
around elections because that is what uh, you know the media is willing to invest money uh, in data journalism when it comes to elections they'll commission opinion polls on when they won't commission opinion polls on anything else so um, i ended up uh, you know frequently sifting through this data and the 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 question that and this gets repeated in academic discourse as well. But the question that's regularly asked is, what is the issue you're going to vote for? What is the issue you voted for? And everyone says development, jobs, um, economic growth. And um, you know we use that uh, to form our understanding of what Indians vote for. We, we run with narratives like caste doesn't matter. People, this is a post-caste electorate. Religion doesn't matter while simultaneously the same survey or another survey is showing you big national level uh, representative survey is showing you that 45% of uh, respondents said that they would like their MP to be of the same caste as them. Um, the majority of people said that um, uh, they would want to turn for help to someone who belonged to the same religion as them in their constituency. Um, and if jobs mattered so much, all uh, in the 2019 election as well, that was the number one issue, jobs, the, the economy. The growth. How is it that at a time when we had historic unemployment, the incumbent was voted back in 2019? I, if nothing else, that should have been the moment at which we all said, maybe let's not use this line ever again, because it's, it's clearly inadequate. Um, politicians, of course, get this. They get this completely, which is that people are voting for ideas that that's that's the the sum total of my thesis around this which is that people vote for ideas and they're, they're a sort of range of it i'm going to resist the temptation to again read from the book but um i you know spoke to a couple of uh, women in um in tamil nadu before the election and uh, one of them said that she voted for the was going to vote for the admk because um in memory of jayalalitha because jayalalitha was a woman in a man's world and that's what she respected now uh, you you would you know academics might call this a feminist vote but she also took money um uh, and was going to vote so you you know a lot of people in especially around tamil nadu elections love to say that people are voting for the person who gave them money um the, the, her neighbor was someone who said that she wanted to vote for the party that was going to beat the bjp because she believed that the bjp was a um, uh, Hindu Hindi party. So you might call it a vote for social justice or federalism. She too took money from the DMK. So, you know, um, these sort of um, uh, reductions of the way uh, people think about politics in the country have done a huge disservice to the way we understand politics and taking opinion polls, opinion polls in and of themselves are not the problem. The way we are taking them at face value and using only one answer to form sort of headlines um, has done huge damage to not just popular understanding, but also um, academic work around elections. Right. So why is the Indian electorate so um, uh, difficult to survey and draw conclusions from? As you said earlier, you know, the, is the, the whole fact that uh, it's uh, journalists and pollsters often cannot capture the multiple motivations of uh, voters because they often ask the wrong questions and are quick to drill down to one answer as the answer. So why is it so difficult? So this is a highly um, heterogeneous country, and we know we know the multiple axes around which uh, samples need to operate to, you know, sort of represent all people. Uh, there are significant significant barriers to surveying as well. Uh, maybe with uh, you know great access of phones uh, to phones that might change a little bit. Um, uh, it's also a country in which. Uh, uh, alliances change frequently, which poses a huge problem to uh, calculations and for, um, you know, uh, predictive opinion polling as well. Um, but there are ways to get past all of this, one of which, one of which is triangulation, you have to look at multiple surveys, you have to uh, journalists and, you know, sort of qualitative and quantitative work, which is a fancy way of saying uh, political journalism and data journalism or opinion polls, uh, treat each other with mutual disdain, while um, the, a better way of getting at it would, would perhaps be triangulating between what the two sets uh, are saying. And uh, some of these are really uh, narratives that we've run with for 50 years now. So they're going to be very hard to, to dislodge. For, for instance, this entire thing of say the Dalit vote, right? Uh, in a, in so many so many polls, you know, there are issues raked up, and and we are told that these are the issues on which the Dalit vote is going to swing or otherwise. But your numbers and your entire analysis shows that the Dalit vote is essentially ineffective, and in in constituencies where 
reservations happen, what happens if, if you want to either read an excerpt from there, because Narayan Swami's example, for example, A. Narayan Swami, you know, how yes. in his own constituency, he couldn't visit a temple and yes. you know, all those things. Yeah, so. yeah the, it's, it's kind of shocking that we have no good serving that actually measures the Dalit vote, because we often use uh, the outcome of reserved constituencies as shorthand for the Dalit vote, while Dalits are a minority in reserved constituencies, which, which is something that just... Uh, you know, has not um, made it through the popular consciousness at all. So what we really should be doing is perhaps serving what uh, non-Dalits are, who they are voting for in uh, reserve constituencies, because they are the ones with the numerical uh, ability to swing the vote. Um, and yes, we, we hear this from Dalit politicians that uh, winning election in a constituency is by no means a sign that they are, you know, widely accepted in it. And uh, the example of the um, MP who could not visit, uh, 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 a, you know, an upper caste uh, hamlet within his own constituency, um, although they said they had voted for the BJP, but they would not let a Dalit person enter the enter the hamlet. This happened just two years ago. What I was afraid of is happening. We're running out of time rapidly. So I'm going to just quickly run through two questions. One is the whole question of since we're in the middle of the pandemic, uh, you know, in parliament, we were told recently that there were no data on oxygen deaths in UP. We were also told earlier that there was no data on the uh, migrants, uh, the number of migrants who died. Um, and if it was not for the website that some of you may know of COVID-19.org, we, would we wouldn't have a clear idea of how the pandemic was progressing in this country. Um, what, according to you, uh, are we missing here? Is the government missing in not releasing uh, accurate and timely COVID data? So I'm also going to answer soon so that we're still able to... Yeah. I'll have one more question. I mean, you want to take both right away? This is very different. Okay, this is about the, um, um, the caste census. All right, and it comes uh, from two perspectives. One, of course, the question of uh, how do we map out the upper 5%, 4% of the population what do they eat where, where does their income come from what they, what do their privileges earn them and all of that uh, uh, so we need we don't, just don't have any data on the obcs particularly you know uh, to say that 52% of their population uh, is not represented in that 27% all of that you know if you can talk about briefly but this larger question as an enumerator uh, and as a journalist the thing that there are some doors that you can walk into easily and ask any questions and there are some doors into, into, into which you just can't enter. And these questions are not valid. So the fact that you can walk into any slum and conduct any number of surveys or of SCSDs, but you'll never have a survey of Javier Brahmins, let's say, right? Or Iyers or Iyengars. So if you can talk about that a little bit, social, socioeconomic aspect. Thanks. Um, I'm going to rush to the answer to leave a little time for people to ask questions. So um, on COVID data, yes, uh, you know, both the examples that you gave are of categories in which the government did not collect data simply by not, you know, you think of it as not creating a column head. If you don't create a column head, there's nothing you can put under it. And then so you say the answer is zero. So uh, it points to two things. One is that we need to start from asking for that to be collected. We need to uh, put in place the system so that those uh, heads of data are collected and that, that only sort of comes through public pressure. Um, and on COVID-19 India.org, which, you know, is the resource for knowing what happened in the last two years and which after they've stopped work at the end of October, some of us have taken on in the form of COVID-19 Bharat.org, which is supposed to, which is doing essentially the same thing. It's, it's, it's shocking that we don't have uh, an official source of government data. All of the sources we use either for this old or the current data set are all government sources. And it's unconscionable that the government hasn't put it together themselves. And just a sort of idea for it, people to think about is that I worry that the more, and you know, Bangalore particularly has this wonderful community of public spirited tech driven people. And, you know, I admire this community hugely. They've done great good for the country. But I worry that the more we bootstrap these solutions to data that the government should be providing, are we lowering the uh, volume on dem democratic pressure for the government to provide this data. Why have we allowed the government to get away with not providing this data? So that's something I worry about the more we come up with alternative solution. On the caste census, yeah, my God, what a political football. It's not even football when you kick it right out of the field and say there's no ball there anymore, right? I mean, they, uh, it, it's ridiculous what the what the UPA did with it as well, which is that they just dumped all of the caste part of it onto Arvind Panagaria's lap and said, you know, good luck with it. Classify all of these. Uh, 
it was un impossible. And you know, the fact that uh, all of us reported on it by saying, yes, this committee exists, that's going to make sense of it when we, it was impossible, it was never going to happen. So yeah, it's it's terrible that we don't have data on this. It's it's unconscionable. There's so many things that we can't answer about it. And yes, I absolutely agree that, you know, how is it okay to turn a, a microscopic lens on all of the uh, attributes of um, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in the country without knowing anything, or uh, asking any questions about uh, things like the practice of untouchability, which is why when the data comes out, it's such a huge shock to everybody because we don't have, you know, sort of routine information um, on things like this. And uh, surveyors, uh, official surveyors as well say that they find it hard to get access into things like um, gated communities. So just leaving you with a last thought, which is that, the census, this year's delayed census will start sometime next year. And we should worry about the answers we get on two ground, two sides. One is we should be pushing for the rich to open up their houses and give answers to it. And the second thing we should worry about is the integrity of data in the backdrop of the CA and IRC, um, you know, tragedy that unfolded across the country. What is the incentive of people to answer correctly to where they came from when they know the, you know, the horrific consequences that it can have? So what we take out of the 2021 when it comes out, that census is going to be very hard to know how much of it is, you know, usable and how much, how much of it is just answers that have come out of fear. So my question is that in the times when researchers and data journalists are scrambling to find data, so how do common people uh, put out their trust in the data and the insights that are coming out, looking at the time when these insights could be really twisted by those who have access to it by any chance? Yeah, great question. So two things. One is that be be skeptical, skeptical about things, but I resist blanket suspicion because, and this is something, you know, we were talking about earlier, the reason that we know all of the things that have happened around data in the last uh, two years is because of journalism. Journalists brought it out. So I find it hard to have a blanket suspicion that all data in the country is being manipulated when the data that there were problems with was exposed by journalists. J journalism in the country is still able to produce this um, this work. So when I see those questions raised, then, then yes, I feel like there's good reason to be uh, uh, suspicious of that. For common people, I'd say there should be, a, you know, all of us journalists should be putting more of our work out, our raw data out on GitHub and things like that, which you are seeing now. For example, all of the excess mortality work that I and other journalists across the country did is all freely available on GitHub for anyone to check and draw their own conclusions from. So a combination of the two. Yeah. So how do you test if it's statistically significant, the data that, you know, the interpretations that you come from those data are, because it could also be chance that it's turning out that way. So I am not trained in math, stats, economics, uh, tech, any of that. So the way I uh, know if something is statistically significant is by asking someone who knows better. Um, I, if I write at a basic layman level, it's because I am a basic layman myself. So um, perhaps other journalists with more advanced skills have their own thresholds for figuring this out. My solution is to pick up the phone and call someone who knows better. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Rukmini. And we could go on and on. But thank you for a really insightful um, uh, discussion. But read the book. It'll be worth your while. Read the book and also uh, check out the notes. The, the, the footnotes are fantastic uh, for young journalists, uh, old journalists, anybody. <laughs> Those are great resources. And the chapter on fertility. Please check that out. I really miss that. Uh, miss bringing that up here. Yeah. Thank awesome. you, Rukmini. Fantastic book. Yeah. Thank you. And definitely seems like a great read.